about religion and state in Israel. We've talked about Jewish nationalism. We've talked about the end of the status quo of the religion and state relations in Israel. And we're going to talk about another angle of religion in Israel, really, as you said, Ari, the focal point, the, the epitome of religious relations in Israel, the place that is the most holy to Jews and very holy to Muslims, the Temple Mount. Uh, the Temple Mount, which has been heating up in terms of activity and in terms, sadly, of violence over the last, I would say, 20 years. Uh, if you know about the Second Intifada, you might know that it's called the Al-Aqsa Intifada. Al-Aqsa is the Muslim name of the Temple Mount, right? So the, the, the whole Intifada is called uh, in the name of the Temple Mount. We've had violent uh, um, 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 circles, violent uh, eruptions uh, coming out of provocations or uh, uh, crises in the Temple Mount in the summer of 2014 and again in the summer of 2015. So the place is hot in more than one meaning. It is contentious and it is volatile. And I want to talk today about, um, I want to lead up to the current heating up of the Temple Mount uh, in talking about the different attitudes to the Temple Mount held by different Zionist streams, different Zionist schools. Uh, that built the state of Israel to see what relationships were with the Temple Mount within different Zionist uh, circles and to see what changed and why the Temple Mount, while not being very interesting, interesting to Jews in Israel, even 30 years ago, is now at the center of politics and, of course, at the center of religion. So that's what I want to do. And, and I'll, I'll and share my, um, just a second, I'll share my, my, uh, my presentation here, right? Whoops. Okay, right. and, and, and I'll begin, I'll begin with uh, a few quotes from MKs not long ago, 2012, 2014. And, 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 and I want to, you know, to give you a vibe of what's happening around the Temple Mount. Sipi Khotobeli, which was the Deputy Foreign Secretary, she is now uh, um, Ambassador to Great Britain. The construction of the temple in its place on the Temple Mount should symbolize the renewal of the sovereignty of the people of Israel in its land. Okay, and Gila Gamliel, who is today the Minister of Intelligence, says, the temple is the people of Israel's ID card. We are the temple. It's the nations of Israel direct contact with the divine. It's our right over this land. And Yuli Edelstein, who was the chairman of the Knesset, of the parliament, says, my job is to engage in the daily process that unites and builds the people of Israel and leads to the temple, etc., etc. I won't read Yeriv Levine, doesn't really matter. You get the picture. These are Likud MKs, members of Knesset, speaking about the Temple Mount. And indeed, except like Gila Gamliel, and, and, and I mean, these are not ultra-Orthodox people. Gila Gamliel is secular. Yariv Levine is also secular. So, so there's something strange here, perhaps, with their fascination with the Temple Mount. And I want to compare this to another saying. This is Moshe Dayan, Minister of Security, reviewing the old city of Jerusalem at the beginning of the Six-Day War, when the old city was still in Jordanian hands. And he says, what do I need all this Vatican for? Okay. Moshe Dayan, Minister of Security of Israel, before the Six-Day War, looks into his binoculars, sees the Temple Mount, Al-Aqsa, sees the Church of the Holy Sepulchers, you know, sees the whole Holy Basin, as, as we call it, and says, I mean, really, what do I need this for? I don't want it. And so my question will be today, how do we get from this right to this? How do we get from Moshe Dayan's uninterested approach to the Temple Mount to the Likud today, very much invested in the Temple Mount. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Tomer, but right now there's a little bit of feedback coming from your mic. So when we turned it up earlier, maybe it went up a little too high. Mm -hmm. So I just want to give you a heads up that yeah. so a little bit of background I'll, noise there. Wait a minute, I'll try to, uh, wait, so just a second, let's, let me, let me, There we go. 
try it now. Okay, so now it should be better. I hope it's better. Um, I can still, whenever you, it, if that's the best we can do, I'm just saying there is a little bit of feedback in the background for some reason. I don't know why. At least I can hear it. I don't know if it's me. Okay, um, I don't know. I'll try to, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really have anything to do. I'm sorry. So, but, but let, let's hope it gets better. And I want to show you the map in general of socialist, of, sorry, Zionist streams in the beginning of the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948. We have on the one hand secular socialist Zionism, which is the undisputed complete hegemony in Israel at that time, right? This is Ben Gurion, this is the labor movement, Mapai. They are, you know, they, they have a government even with, with, with a minimal coalition uh, uh, adjustments. Uh, it, it, they, they own the state basically. And then we have also religious Zionism, which was then very small. And we have revisionist Zionism, the right wing Zionism, which was the Zionism of Jabotinsky, Begin, uh, etc. And I want to show now the different attitudes these streams had towards the Temple Mount. So, all right, yeah. So if we look at Zionism even before secular socialism, even, even with Herzl, the Temple Mount was always uh, um, was always dealt with in in some hope that it will that it will lose its religious appeal and turn into something else, right? Herzl says, and I'm reading the blue bottom part of the passage: the magnificent hall of peace with its solemn demeanor, where international congresses of peace seekers and scholars of all branches of science would gather. The old city was a kind of internationalized space. So Herzl in his Alt Neuland, in his utopish, utopian novel of Israel, of the state of Israel to be, puts the temple in a place of a, a hall of congresses, of international uh, studies, of men of science, of an internationalized space. But it's not only Herzl. Ben Gurion himself, as late as, as 37, said this, about Jerusalem. To this day, I see a great tragedy in the lack of division of Jerusalem into two separate municipalities. Our situation in Jerusalem is completely different now, and perhaps our political fate in our immediate future would have changed fundamentally had we understood and dared to divide Jerusalem. To our woes, the patriotic cliche triumphed in Jerusalem, the barren, empty, idiotic cliche of the creative national exploit and Jerusalem is now unified under the rule of the Nashashidis and the Chaldeen. These are prominent Palestinian families, Jerusalemite Palestinian families. A Jewish Jerusalem free of the controlling, emasculating partnership of the Arab Effendi and the British clerk, cut off from the old city, which is hopeless, save being turned into a cultural, spiritual museum of all faith and exempt from the Arab neighborhood that drain our power, should have energized our creative talent, centered our funds and strength, but the idle cliche was stronger. Could you ever have imagined to hear Ben Gurion speaking this way? Right? Ben Gurion is, is, is writing to the Mapai party after the, res the, the a resolution of the Peel Committee. The Peel Committee in 1937 was a British committee coming to Israel to study why is there so much violence between Arabs and Jews and Arabs and British and Jews and British? What's happening here? And the Peel Committee wanted, it was the first one to suggest to divide the land of Israel between the two nations, Arab and Jewish. And Baron Guyon wanted Jerusalem to be divided. But other people in the uh, Zionist camp said, no, we need all Jerusalem. And Ben Guyon here is saying, no, this is a mistake. And why is it a mistake? He thinks the old city <clears throat> is hopeless save being turned into a cultural, spiritual museum of all faith. He doesn't want religious holy sites. It doesn't interest Ben Gurion, who is completely secular. And he thinks that taking the old city will, uh, will hurt the creative national exploit, will hurt the energy of secular, socialist, creative Judaism, and will drag Judaism down, right, Will will uh, will uh, will stop the energized and creative talent 
and uh, in which he wants to center on a secular modern society. So this was the basic attitude of the socialist, secular, Zionist uh, uh, left or, or hegemony in the beginning of the state of Israel's existence. They didn't want the Temple Mount. They didn't want even the old city of Jerusalem. And this, and this is what his, sorry, this is what we can learn here with Moshe Dayan's even in 67 saying, what do I need all this Vatican for? So that's one type of Zionism and what he thought about the old city. Let's now take religious Zionism and see what it thinks about the Temple Mount and the old city. This is Rabbi Avram Yitzhak Cohen Cook, the first chief rabbi of Israel, founded the chief rabbinate of Israel in 1921, with, of course, with collaboration of, uh, with the British. And he's talking about Baron Rothschild's visit to the Temple Mount 1914. And he says, my heart aches for the desecration caused by being at the holy place of the temple and more so for not being told that it is forbidden. A single defect in the sanctity of our holy abode is more costly than a million townships, <clears throat> right? So Baron Rothschild, of course, was the great philanthropist who gave a lot of money to buy lands for Jews in Israel. And, Re and Rabbi Cook says the fact that he ascended the Temple Mount is so bad that it, is, it, 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 it hurts me more than all the good things he did for the Jewish uh, settlements in Israel, in, in Mandate Israel, right? That's what Abraham and Tzachwein Cook says. And this is, I would say, the basic or the old classic uh, attitude of religious Zionism to the Temple Mount. The Temple is forbidden. The Temple is holy, and we are not to go there. It's, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's something that we are forbidden to ascend. Indeed, here is a, a flyer, an ad posted uh, by uh, the chief rabbinate, and I'm reading the English here at the bottom, a public warning by his eminence, the chief rabbi of Eretz Israel, Abraham Yitzchak Cook, and he says, our dear brethren who come from far and near to visit the holy city of Jerusalem, be warned and remember that it is strictly forbidden by Jewish law and religion to enter the temple area, Haram al-Sharif, another name for the Muslim, another Muslim name for the place, or to ascend the Harabite. Harabite is the temple mount, right? So it is halachically, it is according to halacha forbidden to go up the temple mount. It's simply some, something that religious Jews do not do. That's why Baron Rothschild did do it. He didn't know it was halachically forbidden or he didn't care about it. But uh, this is the basic idea for religious Zionism. We don't go there. And Moshe Chaim Shapira, the head of the religious Zionist party in 1967, uh, on the eve, again, this is, the, this is just the beginning of the Six Day War, he will say, if the old city is in our hands, and if they come and propose to make it an internationalized city, I will agree to it. Okay, so this is the political leader of religious Zionism in 1967, saying, yes, it's okay, we will make it an internationalized city. And a member of his party, Zerach Val Hefti, again, July 16, in 1967, this is after the war, after the war, he, he says in an interview in the radio, I am thrilled that the halacha decrees that the third temple ought to be built by God. I am thrilled as this means we are not entering into a struggle with the Muslim faith. What does he mean? He means we're not going to build the, the third temple and we not, don't need to worry about building the third temple because it's going to be a divine act. It's going to, the third temple will simply descend from the sky complete. And we don't need to bother ourselves about it. So definitely we're not going to ascend the Temple Mount. We're not going to do anything uh, active about it. We're just going to wait. And I'm thrilled about it because it means we don't get into a conflict with the Muslim faith, right? Imagine a leader of religious Zionism saying such a sentence today. It's, it's simply unimaginable. So we've got secular socialist Zionism. We've got religious Zionism, and I want now to see what the attitude of the Temple Mount was with revisionist Zionism, right-wing secular Zionism. 
And here we have a completely different story. I brought here uh, the, the fundamentals of revival or the fundamentals of uh, rejuvenation. It's the Lehi Underground Movement's Constitution. The Lehi was a, a underground movement. It was a terrorist organization before the founding of the State of Israel, fought against the British and the Arabs. And they, in, in 1941-42, uh, um, um, established a constitution for themselves with 18 clauses, sorry, which the last one of them, clause number 18 says, the house, the building of the third temple is a symbol of the days of complete redemption. So the secular right-wing Zionism wants to build the temple, wants to build the third temple as a symbol of complete redemption. It's not that they want to sacrifice cows and sheep there, but for them it is symbolic in a very important way. It's a focal point of national feeling. And this attitude continues, continues even after the state of Israel is founded. I bring you a quote by Israel Eldad, one of the prominent intellectuals of the right wing in Israel until the 70s, perhaps a very interesting person. And he writes this, uh, uh, along the same lines. He says <clears throat> about the Temple Mount, this is the foundation stone of our world. We are bound for sacrifice upon it. We exist upon it. Whoever thinks the temple is a matter of religious worship and as such under the jurisdiction of the ministry of religious services has not grasped the essence of the thing called the people of Israel in the world. The temple cannot be some nicer Yeshurun that could be also in New York. The link of the temple to the geopolitical and historical point called the Temple Mount is what symbolizes the special essence of our worldview. Okay. So what do, we have, what do we have here? We've got Israel Dad telling us that if you think the Temple Mount is some religious issue to be dealt with by rabbis, just as there's a nice synagogue in Manhattan called Yeshurun, it's very nice and beautiful and rabbis officiate it, you don't understand anything about the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is a matter of geopolitical significance. And for us, it, it is a, a place that we are bound upon for sacrifice. It is something of immense national import. Again, this is the attitude the right wing had at that time. And, 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 so, and, and so we see that the right wing had a different attitude than the left or the religious Zionist uh, public and the ultra orthodox, I didn't mention them, but they go with the religious Zionism at that time. Now, I want to, uh, I want to um, pause a minute and, and see what's really about with the Temple Mount, right? What, what really do we have there? What are we talking about? So on the right, I have a diagram of the Temple Mount, the whole mountain, which is today the Haram al-Sharif, in Arabic, uh, the, the holy place and the place of the Dome of the Rock, the place of Al-Aqsa Mosque. This here, you see my cursor? Wait, I'll, I'll color it, perhaps. Wait, right, here we go. Okay, this... This is technically the El Aqsa Mosque. It's a building on one end of the Temple Mount, but really today the entire mountain is called the El Aqsa Mosque, and indeed Muslims pray over the entire mountain. The Dome of the Rock over here is not technically a mosque. It is a very important. It is a very significant Muslim building. It is actually the first grand Islamic uh, construction ever. It, it was built at the end of the seventh century. And it, it hovers over the rock of a foundation, the, the rock that is believed by Jewish and Muslim mythology that the, uh, that, that the creation of the world started over there. And indeed many important uh, mythological um, events uh, were there, but I'm not going to go into it now. On the left, you see a diagram of the second Herodian 
uh, temple of Israel, the great, uh, the temple in its uh, majesty. Uh, and, and, and as you probably can notice, the temple is very much smaller than the entire temple mount. And this will be of import uh, in, in just a few minutes. And, and, and when we try to understand what is really forbidden for religious Jews to do on the temple mount. So let's try to understand. Maimonides says, even though the temple is now in ruin because of our sins, a person must hold its sight in awe as one would regard it when it was standing. So Maimonides says to us, when the temple was built, it was obvious that only the priests can go inside its more holy uh, 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 rooms and areas. And of course, the high priest can go to the Holy of Holies but only once a year in Yom Kippur, right? So most of Israel could not go into the holy place of the temple. But Maimonides says, even though that the temple is now destroyed, we still have to regard the place of the temple as holy and not go into it uh, without proper, I mean, if you're not a priest, etc., or without proper purification rituals before it. Rabbi Meir Cohen of, uh, of Radin, uh, uh, a very important uh, halachic uh, 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 decree, lawyer says, one who enters now into the place of the temple sins a mortal sin, correct, as we are now all defiled by the defilement of this. Okay, so the halacha today is that Jews may not enter the place of the temple. And this is why religious Zionists and ultra-Orthodox are evading going up the Temple Mount. But again, if you notice, there is a lot of room around the Temple that you in the Temple Mount. I mean, you don't have to go on the Temple Mount. You know what, let me, no. I mean, you can go on the Temple Mount and simply not step inside the bounds of the Temple. But as Shlomo Avinir tells us, and perhaps I'm not going to read this entire answer to the question, what is the opinion of Rabbi in relation to ascending the Temple Mount? He said, really, we're not entering the Temple Mount for a very simple reason. We don't know exactly where on the Temple Mount the Temple was constructed. So lest we make a mistake and by accident step somewhere that is holy and we should not be stepping into, and it's halakhically forbidden to step into, we will refrain from going up the Temple Mount in total. We just don't go there at all, okay? But I want to say there's another more interesting reason why religious people don't go to the Temple Mount. And here I, I'll, I'll read another uh, a passage by uh, Rabbi Tzaka Cohen Kup, again, the first chief rabbi in Israel, and, who, and, and, a, and a rabbi that is considered today perhaps the prominent among the spiritual leaders of religious Zionism. So Cook says, right, just a second. Chazal, our sages, saw that it should sanctify the temple so that the supreme fear of Moram Mikdash will be instilled in us. And it is exactly by being far that this fear will be planted in the heart. We know that the feeling of sanctity and honor is established by exclusion and denial of approximation. Thus also by refraining from approaching when we are unpure to the holy place, we observe the commandment of Moramic Dash. And this is more precious than the same fear that comes by proximity when we are not worthy of it. So Cook says another thing. It's not only that we not, don't know exactly where the temple was and we need to be careful not to step inside the holy place and desecrate it, etc. It's also that we are fearful. We are in awe of the mighty sanctity of the place and that it is the proper religious attitude to stay away, to be far from what is so holy. And I would say this is the prominent reason why until even 20 years ago, religious Jews did not ascend the Temple Mount. It's not for mere technical reasons that they don't know exactly where the Temple Mount is. It's this attitude of, uh, of, um, of distance and awe from a holy place. And indeed, 
Rabbi Tao, uh, a student of uh, uh, Rabbi Cook, says the same thing when he, uh, when the uh, Jewish underground was caught at the beginning of the 80s. Perhaps we'll skip this, it's not so important. And even until 1991, we can find in Haaretz newspaper uh, uh, an op-ed, which is really an open letter from a prominent rabbi within religious Zionism, Rabbi uh, Menachem Fluman, who talks to the, to, who really um, um, addresses Palestinians in Israel and says to them, look what he says, he says, the national religious public's, Rav Cook's disciples concept of, concept consists of two very forceful elements, a very realistic materializing one, the actual settlement of entire Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, and a messianic spiritual one, objection to entering the Temple Mount. The Messianic element is perceived from an orthodox point of view, waiting silently for the Messiah, not creating a false Messiah by our own hands. The holiness of the Temple Mount is expressed not by barging into it, but rather by withdrawing from it. Okay, so in 1991, Rabbi Menachem Fuman can tell the Palestinians in Israel, listen, we have an argument about the settlements in Judea and Samaria. We are going to settle the entire land of Israel. But what you can be calm about is the Temple Mount. Here, we're not touching it. Here we are adopting an ultra-Orthodox, as it were, attitude, which says we wait for the Messiah. We're not doing anything. So this is 1991. But something very prominent has changed, dramatic, has changed since then. And the first sign of change was this. 1996, February, the Yesha Rabbinical Council, Yesha is an acronym for Judea and Samaria in, in Hebrew, Yudav uh, Shumron. The Yesha Rabbinical Council is the first prominent rabbinical voice in Israel that allows ascending the Temple Mount for religious Jews. And this is what they say. We call any rabbi who holds that the ascent to the Temple Mount is allowed, to ascend himself and to instruct his congregation how to ascend according to the halakha. For it is a disgrace to us that the Arabs, they say, let us take possessions of the pastoral lands of God. They ascend in the tens of thousands when we do not ascend even one of a city and two of a family. So this is the first prominent rabbinical voice in Israel saying, it's okay to ascend the Temple Mount. Do it. And why do they do it? They lay it out quite simply. The Arabs are ascending the Temple Mount, and we are not. And how can we let them go up the Temple Mount and leave us uh, in a sort of uh, uh, behind, really? But wait a minute. Muslims have been ascending the Temple Mount, Al-Aqsa, Haram Sharif, really, for what? Millennia, right? For 1,300 years. Nothing has changed between 91 and 96 on that account. What has changed between 91 and 96? I'll tell you. What has changed is the Oslo process. 93, 94, 95, Israel and the PLO are negotiating, as really separating within the land of Israel into two states, the two-state solution. And uh, uh, the Oslo process is, is, is going uh, uh, full steam ahead. And religious Zionist rabbis are very frightened that within the negotiations in the Oslo process, the Temple Mount will be up for negotiation. And perhaps Rabin or another uh, uh, prime minister from uh, the more left wing in Israel will give up the Temple Mount will give up Al-Aqsa for the Palestinians in some sort of peace treaty. And this, I would say, is the reason why they are suddenly changing their tune towards ascending the Temple Mount. I'm not saying it's not legitimate. The Halakha responds to political uh, life. It's, it's not nothing illegitimate, it's okay. But, but this is what we need to observe and notice here. The Halakha is changing corresponding to political activity and really out of fear of the religious Zionists that they will soon move perhaps 
sovereignty over the Temple Mount. Okay? Now, this is 96. It's not that a lot of religious Zionists ascended the Temple Mount in 96, but since then, ascension to the Temple Mount has been rising and rising in a very clear uh, trajectory. And it has come to this that today, in a survey conducted May 2014, and this is already almost 10 years ago, right? Among religious Zionist public, 75.4% said that they favored the ascent of Jews to the Temple Mount compared to 24.6% that, that are against. So three fourths, 75% of religious Zionists today are, are for ascending the Temple Mount. Again, remember Rabbi Cook, himself, the chief rabbi of Israel, and again, one of the perhaps the prominent spiritual leader of religious Zionism, which forbade it completely. Remember centuries of halachic ruling forbidding it completely. Indeed, I would say no prominent halachic uh, rabbi, halachic leader for the last 200 years had, uh, has allowed the ascension of Jews to the Temple Mount. Right? So this is a complete break with the halakha, a complete break with custom. Okay? Not that they don't have the, their halakhic reasons how, how they make this kosher. Right? They do. I mean, they're not stupid. Right? But I'm saying it's something that, we, that was unheard of even in 1991. Right? And so today, 75% of religious Zionism are for it. And when asked what are the reasons on which to base oneself when it comes to Jews going up the Temple Mount, of classic religious Zionism, 39% said that the ascent is needed in order to witness the special site. 54%, this is cumulative, it's not, uh, you know, but thought that a visit should be made in order to carry out a positive commandment, mitzvah say and prayer at the site. 58% claim that the ascent will raise awareness about the temple and its meaning and fully 96.8% replied that visiting the site should constitute a contribution to strengthening Israel's sovereignty in the Holy Place. Okay, this is the main issue to be noticed here. The ascension to the Temple Mount is really not so much about prayer, it's not so much about worship, it's at the bottom about strengthening Israel's sovereignty over the site and for the people who believe over the entire land of Israel by going up to the Temple Mount. And I, just a second. Right, and, and uh, wait, I want to, and I want to go to these quotes again, right? The construction of the Temple in its place on the Temple Mount should symbolize the renewal of sovereignty of the people of Israel, etc., etc. Look at this, right? It's the sovereignty of the people of Israel. It makes us great. It gives us power. It's not a religious thing. It's about sovereignty, says Moshe Feiglin, a former Likud MK and a religious Zionist person. And Bezalel Smotrich, today's Israel finance minister, says, I will, God willing, ascend the Temple Mount when ministers of Knesset members will be able to ascend freely and upright for the realization of the sovereignty of the state of Israel on the Mount. Okay? It's quite clear from what these people say themselves that the issue at the base of all this is sovereignty, is control of the Temple Mount, right? And, and so if we want to understand what changed between the last 200 years and even 1991 and today, we need to take this into account. So, just a second. So what caused the changes? I want to ask what caused the changes within religious Zionism and what caused the changes within the entire Israeli right. And within religious Zionism, a very important thing that caused the changes was the disengagement uh, as, it call, as, it, as it is called from Gaza in 2005, the withdrawal of Israel from the Gaza Strip and the demolition of 20-something settlements in the Gaza Strip in 2005. This event was a very traumatic event for religious Zionism. 
not only in that many people lost their houses there, right? And not only in that the state of Israel really tore up uh, settlements that it invested uh, a lot in and really moved them and really and, and withdrew from territory that it gave to the Palestinians. This was a theological shock. It was a shock in what these people perceived and believed as the correct um, progression of the Messianic process. For them, settling the land of Israel is a forwarding, progressing the, the Messianic process. And this Messianic process is non, uh, it's deterministic. It's a one-way street. You cannot go back. And the fact that Israel went back and uprooted and demolished whole settlements was a theological crisis, was a crisis of faith for these people. And I would say that for many of them, not all, but for many of them, the, the messianic energy, as it were, moved from the building of settlements to the Temple Mount. So we are no longer investing so much in building settlements in a theological way. Of course, we're doing it. Right? Of course, it's important to us. But for many of them, the focal point of the messianic process moved to the Temple Mount, which is really the end point of that process, right? It's really the, the end of the messianic process, building a temple and uh, having a, a, a king of David reign from Jerusalem, king of the house of David reign from Jerusalem, etc. So for religious Zionism, this was a seminal event that shook uh, the tectonic uh, uh, plates, as it were, and change things. But what about the entire religious right? I would say that if this was the picture of the, the Zionist uh, uh, denominations or, or streams at the beginning of the establishment of the state of Israel, today we have something like this. Secular socialist Zionism is no more. There's no more socialism. We do have progressive Zionism or liberal Zionism, more liberal Zionism, but it is very small or it's smaller. And what we have in a very prominent way is ethno-national Zionism. And I would say that the right revisionist right turned into ethno-national Zionism and that even the religious Zionist as religious Zionism turned also into ethno-nationalism. I mean, it, they're not so different in the way they believe uh, and act than the secular right. And if so, we now understand these or these uh, uh, voices coming from religious Zionism, because here these people are all religious Zionism. Tzipi Chotoveli, Yudha Glik, Moshe Feigen, and Mitzalel Smotrich are all religious Zionism. And, and really what they're saying is the mountain for us is not a religious thing. Yes, we're praying there or whatever, we want to pray there, but it is first and foremost a symbol of sovereignty, a focal point for our national feelings. And if you remember, this is exactly what it was for revisionist secular Zionism at the beginning of the, uh, of, of, of the establishment of the state of Israel. So from the minority revisionist Zionist secular a secular group and its attitude towards the temple, this attitude now really conquered, really uh, um, established itself in the entire right wing, I would say, of Israeli politics and certainly in religious Zionism that now see the Temple Mount less as a religious site and more as a site of sovereignty. This is also why, of course, that the halachic attitude towards the site could change. It is no longer so much a place of awe and sacredness that we must fear and avoid, but a place of sovereignty and national importance that we must control. I will end with one more uh, slide. Gershom Sholem, the famous uh, scholar of Kabbalah, the famous researcher of uh, Jewish mysticism, uh, in his article Towards an Understanding of the Messianic Idea, 1960, says this, ends the article with this. 
Whether or not Jewish history will be able to endure its entry into the concrete realm without perishing in the crisis of the messianic claim that has virtually been conjured up from its depth. That is the question that out of this great and dangerous past, the Jew of this age poses to his present and to his future. Shonem says this, Jewish history has entered concrete realm, meaning it's in history. We have established a state. We are actors in history. We are no longer passive observers. We are in history. But this entering into history has conjured up a messianic claim. Because if the Jews have a kingdom, the next logical step for them is to build a temple and to throne a king and to christen a king, right? That's what Jews do with the kingdom according to biblical narrative. So whether or not Jewish history will be able to endure this entry into the concrete realm without perishing in the crisis of the messianic claim, right? Will Israel be able to withdraw, withhold itself from continuing the messianic claim and trying to accomplish it, trying to indeed build the third temple? This is the great question that the Jew of this age poses to his present and to his future, etc. Right? This is what Sholem says is the greatest question. And this is why I call this presentation the end point of Zionism. Because the Temple Mount is both the end point in a logical biblical narrative for a Jewish kingdom, and it's the end of Zionism as a realistic political movement in history, in Jewish history and in world history. So I'll end here and open for questions. Thank you. Wow, terrific. Um, that was an amazing trip through the history of the Temple Mount and how it has changed. So here's some questions that I've seen already come up. Can you explain, first, let's start with this. Um, can you explain why right-wing Zionism is called revisionist Zionism? Why is that, why is the term revisionist used? So it's, it's, yeah, it's actually a very banal reason. Uh, Jabotinsky withdrew from the main uh, Zionist organization because he, he, he saw his ideas and his voice could not take a, a prominent enough place there. Rightly so, because the, the left held complete hegemony. And so he withdrew and, and called his movement revisionist. They are revising the aims of Zionism, what we really want, what Zionism should really do. We're doing a revision. That's it. Okay. That was a good question from our audience. Um, second, my understanding is that, and actually I've been up, we took our CSP. We've had three adventures to Israel, and we have the one coming up in May. And on our most recent one, we took a group up, uh, second one, the second one, we went up to the, we did a tour of the um, Temple Mount. I think it's important to go up there just to understand everything you just showed us, to understand what's up there, you know, what it looks like, what it feels like. We have uh, Kathleen Robinson has, has apparently taken many groups up there. So, um, but isn't there a sign, isn't there a, re a restriction that you can go up there as you, but you cannot pray. So then when these groups that, when these religious Zionist groups go up there, what do they do? All right, so first of all, you'll see a sign, and let's say take it down till then, you'll see a sign from the chief rabbinate of Israel that says, don't go there. Jews are forbidden to go up the Temple Mount, just like the sign that Rabbi Isaac Cohen Cook, uh, uh, um, you know, put up in 1922, right? It's the same, it's the same, the, the hala for the ultra-Orthodox, and the ultra-Orthodox now control the chief rabbinate of Israel, nothing has changed. The halacha still says that Jews cannot go up the Temple Mount. But for Jews who do go up the Temple Mount, there is a sign that says you are forbidden to pray. This is what is called the status quo of the Temple Mount. Muslims are allowed to worship in the Temple Mount. All other religions are allowed only to visit the site. Okay? Now, there has been a few changes um, over the last few years. So, until, the, until a few years ago, Jews simply could not pray. And if you were caught praying, you would be taken off the Temple Mount by police, by Jewish police, right? Uh, but today there is a site on the Temple Mount that Jews do pray in. They do not do it in a loud voice and not with many move, much moving around, but there's a site there. If you take uh, a tour guide that knows they can show you, it's just near some wall in the back. So Jews can actually pray there in, 
in a, a, a concealed way or in a, a in an in, inconspicuous way, right? But it is a problem. I mean, it, it's a problem on one hand for the freedom of religion of Jews, and of course, it's a problem within the greatest the greater context of a struggle, a national and a religious struggle in Israel right now between the Jews and the Muslims, between Israelis and Palestinians, uh, that the Temple Mount is taking center stage in. So Haredim don't go up there. Religious Zionists do go up there. Does the average secular Israeli go up on the Temple Mount? I would say no. No. Um, the average secular Israeli doesn't go there. The amount of people who go there, Jewish, Jewish persons who go there are about a thousand, sometimes a thousand five hundred a month. To you know, for a night, for a comparison, um, for the, the if, uh, Palestinians go there in the tens of thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands a month. Okay, Friday prayers, etc. So, so there's not a lot of Jews going up there, but it's more a matter of consensus of a political shift within religious Zionism and indeed also in the secular right of Israel that suddenly is taking a lot of interest in the temple. When do religious Zionists go up? Is there like a, uh, they go up before Rosh Hashanah? Is there like a time? So if Ahuva's in Israel and she wants to hang out with a group and go up there, when, when would she go? Uh, well, she or he, there, there's a difference. Okay, right, not that she's a religious Zionist. I don't, I, but she can be, I was just, you. okay, so let's say a he. Um, uh, let's set up Rabbi Linson. Ahuva and Rabbi Linson want to go up and they want to hang out with the religious Zionists to see what it's all about. When when do they generally go up there? I would say before the, the high holidays, they would go up there and before a few other holidays like in the 9th of Av, right? And a lot of times before weddings, before your own wedding, you go there for a, a visit. That's what uh, sometimes... Uh, um, women do though uh, well this is I mean there, uh, this is another area of halachic contention within orthodox circles because because women uh, I mean it's a lot of a lot to do with the mikveh and are women allowed to dip in the mikveh before weddings etc I won't go into it but but there's a lot of talk about it in halachic circles okay we'll keep Ahuva and Rabbi Linson apprise as the next going up. Um, so there were some notes saying Israel obviously captured all Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount, and yet gave gave some control of it back. If you if you were looking back in history, what would happen if Israel didn't give it back? Did Israel have any choice to keep the Temple Mount, and should it have kept the Temple Mount? Um, and yeah. What, what are the ramifications if it had? Is, was it even a possibility? I mean, if it was a possibility, it was for a very short time after the Six Day War, where the entire world, including Israel, was in complete shock of the Israeli victory. Things could have perhaps been done then that would not have caused an immense uproar in the entire Muslim world. And even that is not for sure. But I. I I mean, but, but, but even after two weeks already, I mean, people began to assess the situation realistically. And there's not a real, a real way that Israel could simply ignore the fact that this is, this is the third holiest site for Sunni Muslims all over the world. It's really, and again, as I said, this is the, 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 the Dome of the Rock is the first major Muslim construction ever. Okay, this is the first grand Muslim building ever in the end, at the end, built at the end of the seventh century. So it, it's there. What are you going to do about it? So, yes, Moshe Dayan gave the what, the uh, keepers of the sanctity of the place, uh, the Muslim what uh, jurisdiction over the place inside it. He said the gates will be in Israeli jurisdiction. And, and the Jordan, the Jordanian kingdom also has. A um, uh, 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 I mean, an angle of jurisdiction in the on the holy site, which is even even formally admitted or recognized by Israel in the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan. Jordan has a stake, a formal stake, in the Temple Mount. So uh, and that's the situation today, and I don't think Israel can you know 
can, can do or wants to do much about it. I'm not proposing anything now. I'm just saying historically at that point, did Israel make a mistake by not keeping the Temple Mount? That, that's but a question, I guess, we, people. What, we, what have we, should, could have done? Let, let's say, let's say in the very, you know, in, you know, during the war, let's say somebody would have bombed the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the whole top of the mountain would be completely clear today. What would we have done? Built a third temple? Started sacrificing animals? had a whole cast of priests that would now officiate Judaism for us. We would bring animals to them. They would sacrifice them, throw their blood around. And as it were, this, this would be our worship of the divine. I don't know. Like this, I mean, th because that's what it means. And then a Sanhedrin would sit and conjugate like inside the temple, which they had a place there, and perhaps a king. You know, that's what it, this leads to. There's not much sense in a temple without a halachic Israel, a halachic state, a theocratic state. And this is what some of these people want even today. So did, we, so did we give back, did the Israelis give back the Temple Mount because the government wanted to avoid the issues you just talked about? Or was it yes, real yes. politique about the Muslim world? It was real politique, but the, the, what, first of all, what do we mean give back? It's still in Israel jurisdiction. Simply the, the interior is, uh, uh, is the, the people responsible for it and officiate it is the what? The Muslim holy, the keepers of the holy. But, but Moshe Dayan, who did that, did that because he didn't want that Vatican. Yes, it was also real politique. We don't want a war with the whole Muslim war, or world. But this is also what I talked about about in the beginning, this attitude of, <laughs> I'm not into holy, holy stuff. This just doesn't speak to me and I don't want it. Yeah. I should probably have told you, I'm a Kohen, you know, so I would have to be working up there, but I'm vegetarian. So I'm kind of happy we're not uh, I don't starting know, the barbecues have, back up there. I have something to lose from not building a temple. So now I started, I'm starting. Yeah, it would be hard for me. Um, have you, have you, uh, this may be a personal question. Have you been up there? Yes, I have. I have, uh, I've actually been up there a few times, even 20 years ago, where, uh, uh, where uh, non-Muslims could still go into the Al-Aqsa Mosque and into the Dome of the Rock. You can't, you can't do that today. This also has changed. But yes, I, I have been there and I go there um, from time to time. I mean, I, I consider myself a religious Jew and, and, and uh, it's a special place for me. Uh, I'm not into building the Third Temple, but yes, I do go there. Final question. So Ben Gvir just went up there, right? Or Smotrich went. And so why did he go up there recently? What was the, can you, can you, I mean, it's so, probably going to tie into everything we just said, but. Exactly. So Ben Gvir goes there, not because he's aching for you know, an intimate connection with the divine or the Shekhinah or something like that. He goes there to assert sovereignty, to assert Jewish control on the place. That's the reason. And again, these people say so themselves. It's not, you don't even have to interpret it, right? So, and, and it's a game. It's a, it's a nationalistic game between Israel and the Palestinians. Have no doubt. This is also a national symbol, not only a religious symbol for the Palestinians, right? Have no doubt. So, it's, and, and this is why also it's so volatile and so much of the political or, or, or the, the violence uh, in Israel has erupted from that place. When we were in Israel, there was a Karlbach um, concert, it was a, a yard site, and a bunch of our group went. I did not get to go, but I was told, and I saw some of the video, there was a lot of imagery of the temple that was behind, like major. And um, one of the participants told me that that has been going on a lot lately, that in these concerts, the visuals are of the Temple Mount, of the Temple. So I assume that's tying into everything you just mentioned to us. This has become now the symbology, the symbol of uh, religious Zionism and settler religious Zionism, right? Yeah. That's, okay. Well, good. I'm glad I understand some things from my trip just uh, last October. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Persico. What a terrific four-part series. Anybody who participated either live or, or watching this on Zoom, has gained a lot of knowledge as to Israel and what's going on and and can now open the newspaper and really understand some of the stuff in a much deeper way. 
So I want to thank you. I want to thank all of our terrific uh, participants with their great questions. I want to wish everybody a happy Elul. You only have a few weeks left before Rosh Hashanah, so start the prep. My little one told me he wants the different apples and different kind of honey, so I got to work on that. But there's a good time just to put Israel a little bit to the back, focus on what's going on in your neighborhood and your community, um, but also take what we're learning here and let it unfold. Do a lot of reading, do more watching, share these videos with your friends, and we hope to have you back, uh, Dr. Persico, for some more programs. So thank, thank you. you thank you for, for joining me and, and, and listening. It was a pleasure, really. And I thank you, and thank you, Ari, for inviting me. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Shabbat shalom. Bye-bye.